Hey guys, welcome to this week's video. Uh, what I wanted to talk about is a, a word that gets thrown around a lot, but I wanted to dive into kind of what it means in terms of snake keeping and the important aspects of it with keeping our snakes, and that word is trust. And a lot of us use that word. Most of us obviously understand what that word means, but sometimes we don't really put it into perspective in how we use that in building relationships with our snakes. And where is trust more important? Is it more important that the snake trusts us or that we trust our animals and how those two interact together? So stay tuned and let's talk about it. We're going to talk about trust. Before we dive into the video, I just want to say, how about them Atlanta Braves? Very, very excited uh, to have won the World Series. Uh, very, very improbable run. Um, back in around the All Spark Star break, I think we had a 0.3% chance of winning. Uh, so pretty impressive. Very excited. Been a fan my whole life. Um, you know, the last time we won the World Series in the mid 90s, I really wasn't. Um, you know, as into it as I am now. So it was a big deal for me to, to watch this one. Uh, I got one of my favorite Borneos here to help us out with this video as we talk about trust. And an interesting thing right now, I'm holding this snake up in the air and you can see he's fairly settled, not uncomfortable at all. This is a very unnatural thing for this animal to do. And the reason that he's comfortable and not freaking out is because he trusts me. And why does that matter? and how did I go about getting that trust? So I think to dive in, the first thing we should look at, um, as much as we don't like anthropomorphizing, it does help sometimes to put things in perspective of people and how we can relate it to these animals. We don't wanna necessarily put them in the same box as us, uh, but it does help us to kind of understand the types of things we wanna do. So with people, um, you know, we're, we often talk about the fact that people have five senses, and that's not true. People have, um, you know, science isn't even sure yet, but somewhere between 20 and 32 senses we actually have. Now, in our day-to-day -day lives, a lot of these senses we don't realize are happening, and a lot of things we've kind of tuned out as time's gone on. Uh, and these senses all work together uh, with our memory, with everything else to kind of teach us things. So when people talk about, oh, taste, touch, smell, you know, all these common things, they don't talk about a sense of balance. They don't talk about all these other senses that we have. And so, and, and how our brain will turn off our response to some of these senses. So when you come home to your house, the smell of your house, another person might walk in and notice, oh, this stinks or, oh, this smells good. It's just your default. So your brain basically ignores that now. So the only time you notice a smell in your home is when it smells outside of the ordinary. So that's your brain recognizing something and kind of tuning it out to where you're no longer paying attention to it. Um, they did an interesting experiment with people and they actually put on, on these like noise canceling headphones so all they could hear was the sound of their own footsteps through receptors that they put in these people's shoes. And so as these people are walking down the street, they turned up and turned down uh, the noise that they were hearing from their footsteps because they were able to control it. So it was the actual footstep, but they were just magnifying and decreasing it. And there was actually a change in how the people carried themselves based on what they were hearing. So these senses that we may not even think about are actually controlling uh, a lot of our life. I don't know who's moving around here, somebody. Um, so they're controlling a lot of our behavior subconsciously, really, without us even realizing it's happening. So when they were making the footsteps sound louder, the people were actually hunched over and walking much more like it was, it was difficult. And when they made the, the sound turn down, the people were almost floating and light and hopping and, and moving around. And so what we're doing with these animals is basically trying to get them to turn off certain senses and just have something as a default. So we want us to be a default level of comfort for them, which is an unnatural ask. And so what we have to do is get into the animal's heads and think of things from their perspective. And from their perspective, a lot of what we ask from a pet snake or a breeder snake is unnatural. 
holding the snake up in the air like this. This is not something that the snake naturally does. In its native habitat, the snake is going to stay low to the ground or underground. It's going to stay in, in leaf litter. It's going to stay in swampy areas. It's not going to be up in the air. It's not going to be up in a tree. So what I'm asking the snake to do right now is to trust me that it's not going to get hurt in this very unnatural position. So what you have to do is one, earn the animal's trust. And how that's done is through confidence, consistency. Uh, a big part of it, as I've talked about in previous episodes, is um, how they're set up. Their cage, their default, their home base, if they're not comfortable there, everything else is an additional stress that's just putting them over the top. If they're very comfortable in their caging and very happy with where they're living, then even when you do put them in situations of stress, it's not really putting them over the edge. So you're, you're asking much less of them uh, and, and stressing them much less by having them in a comfortable home setup. Every animal is going to be a little bit different. So when you're setting up an animal, you have a basis for a species and then you're going to adjust from there based on the individual. So with my hatchlings, I start them off on wet paper towels with a water dish and that's it. No hide, no nothing. Six quart tub, uh, like you see here. This is probably a dirty one, but um, I'm in the middle of switching all these out. But so there's a six quart tub uh, with, with wet paper towels, damp really, and uh, a water dish, that's it. And I leave them alone for about a week. I'll clean them up, I'll start food trials. When I start food trials, uh, if an animal eats very comfortably, if the animal appears very comfortable in that environment, then I don't need to change anything. Sometimes over the course of a few weeks, you see behavior where an animal is very, very nervous. Um, it might try to shove itself underneath its water dish. Every time you open the tub, it might retreat from you or get into a defensive posture. So these are the animals that I might introduce a hide to, or I might move on to sphagnum moss, or, or just try to change some things around in there that'll make them more comfortable to give them a more comfortable default at home, which A, helps with their feeding trials. They're more likely to eat when they're more comfortable, uh, especially because eating for these animals is their most vulnerable time. Eating and in shed are really the two times where these animals are at the most danger uh, from predators because they're not able to, to move as quickly, defend themselves, see whatever it is that's altered within those senses that they're relying on to tell them what's safe and what's not. Um, and so, for an animal to eat, they know they're vulnerable. Obviously their mouth is compromised while they're swallowing food. They can't bite and that's really their best defense. So the more comfortable you have an animal, the more likely it is to take frozen thawed prey or a variety of prey items because it doesn't take as much convincing of them that they can take that risk to eating. So when you have an animal that's very nervous, it's less likely to react to a greater variety of prey or, or ways you're, you're providing them with prey because they're nervous. Uh, you really have to trigger every single hunger response in that animal to get that food response out of it. Whereas a super comfortable animal is going to be more confident and more willing to approach anything that comes along and see if it's edible because they feel safe. So safety, consistency, confidence is key. If you're nervous, these animals can sense it and it makes them nervous because it tells them something's wrong. They don't know what's wrong, but they know something is wrong. And so they're automatically on a level of higher alert. Uh, whereas if you're confident, you're comfortable, uh, you know, I'm moving this animal around, I'm not paying attention to where he's going or if he's going to bite me because I know that he's not going to. And if he does, it happens. I'm not worried about it. It's not going to hurt. It's not a big deal. Uh, but, you know, I have a track record with this animal the same way that I've been consistent with him. He's been consistent with me. He's never struck at me. He's never tried to bite me. He's never done something that tells me I need to be worried about that. Um, and obviously, given the fact that he's not a venomous snake, he's not a, a large enough snake to, to do any damage to me. There's no reason to be concerned about it. If he bites, he bites. Who cares? Um, you know, it's not going to it's not going to affect me at all. So the best way to prevent getting bit by an animal is to think that it's not going to bite you. Um, because when you have that confidence and when you handle it a certain way, it makes the animal more comfortable. If you're handling this animal like, oh man, I'm so scared and trying to constantly keep its head away from you and doing all these things, it's unnatural to the animal and it starts to throw them off where they feel like, okay, something's off here. Why is he behaving this way? Um, and then they get nervous and they go to their default and their default is often to defend themselves. So to me, I think it's more important 
that we trust our animals than they trust us because the better we trust them, the more that's gonna be returned. It's gonna put them into better situations. It's gonna make us more confident. It's gonna make us handle them appropriately. We can focus on housing. We can focus on approach and keeping them. And then once they're comfortable, you know, he couldn't even see my hand coming. My hand's touching him. He's not even reacting to it because he's used to that. I pet his chin a lot. He's used to it. There's nothing happening that's outside of the realm of, of normal for him. Uh, and that's the key with these animals. And even having him this close to my face and talking at him, that's a very predatory thing to do. And so I'm asking him to ignore his instincts of me being a predator. And that takes a lot of time sometimes with certain animals. Certain animals are wired differently than others. They all have individual inherent personalities at birth that you can work with, with the whole nature versus nurture thing. You can definitely work with it and change them and get them to accept things that they don't initially. But in times of stress, they are always going to default back to what's natural to them, to their natural personality. And so this snake has always been very confident, always been very bold, always been very comfortable. Um, and it's hard to get him into a situation where he doesn't feel that way. I have other snakes that are very, very nervous and take a long period of time to get comfortable. So it's a matter of learning them. It's a matter of paying attention to their body language. That is really, really key. Um, you know, you can tell from this video, he's a very relaxed animal. There's nothing about his body language that appears nervous. You know, he's curious. He's trying to figure out what the hell we're doing right now, but he's not nervous about it. Um, and that's, that's a very, very big deal. So he's got a little bit of wide pupils because he's engaged in his environment and he's a little like, hey, what's going on? What are we doing? Why are we just sitting here like this? But he's not nervous about it. He's not scared. He's not doubling back. He's actually coming towards me. Um, you know, so he's obviously not afraid of me. He wouldn't be coming towards me if he was afraid of me. But he's, he's a great snake. Um, not only is he cool looking, but just awesome personality. And you can't beat that. Um, but consistency is going to be your best friend. Oh, who the hell is making a paper for it in there, but they're pushing it all over the place. Um, you know, consistency is your biggest thing. These animals do very well with consistency. When they learn a routine and how things are going to happen, uh, the less things that happen outside of that routine, the less reason they have to be nervous because now they have a predictable pattern, uh, which is what's going to allow them to trust you. That they know that when you come in there, you're not going to hurt them. They know that you're not trying to eat them. Um, you know, and then they can also learn patterns with feeding. And so they'll know when it's feeding time versus not feeding time. My snakes in general are pretty good. Uh, the only ones that really look for food, even when it's not food, food time, are my female olive python. She's very, very food assertive, always in her cage. Once you get her out, she'll drop that most of the time. Not always. Uh, Electra, this time of year, when she's looking to breed, she is insatiable with food and uh, there's no telling her that she's not getting fed. So when you open her cage, like I'll even start pulling the cage off the rack and you already feel her body shoot forward, not in a strike, but she's just getting herself into position thinking, okay, this is going to be food. This is going to be food. And she'll come flying right out of the tub, stand up, you know, as far as she can muscle control wise on the side of it and uh, be looking for food. And then you have to convince her that she's not eating, uh, which usually once I get my hands on her, she'll drop. Um, but every once in a while, if I do something outside of routine, like one time I tried to show somebody a video of, of her and I only had one hand on her instead of two and in her mind that confused her. And so she actually did fire a strike because it wasn't consistent. Normally I always have both hands on her when I'm going to pick her up. Now I went to pick her up with one hand, just enough of a change to make her say, uh, uh, something's off here. As soon as I put two hands, she went back to being relaxed in herself. So when you do things outside of the norm with these animals, they know there's a difference. They're smart, they're not stupid. Uh, especially when it comes to bloods and short tails, there's a lot going on in these, these little heads. Um, they're very interactive, they're very personable, they're very curious, uh, especially when they're comfortable. So you have to treat them like an intelligent animal and not a stupid animal. Because if you treat them like a stupid animal, you're probably not gonna have a great relationship with them. Um, and you know, when I say relationship, people think of it in the social aspect. It doesn't mean that the snake loves me. It doesn't mean that it even likes me. It just means that it's comfortable with me. It trusts me. Um, you know, just because it comes towards me and lets me pet it and do all these things, you know, it's just looking for something that reassures it that this is normal, consistent, and okay. 
Um, it's not affection in the sense that, you know, a dog might or, um, you know, another person. But definitely you want to look at this from a physiological standpoint, what these animals are built to do, what you're asking them to do that's unnatural. And if you have those unnatural expectations, i.e. handling a snake and being a pet, then you need to put in the work to, you know, be consistent and earn that animal's trust. So I'd love to see you guys hit the comments and tell me what you think about trust and, and how you go about earning it with your animals, experiences that you've had with an animal maybe that was defensive at first that you were able to win over and get to be a reliable animal because that's really what trust is, it's reliability. It's if I put you in a given situation, I can predict the outcome of your behavior and how it's going to go. I can predict that I can hold this snake out and he's not gonna get nervous and flop. I have other snakes I would not hold out like this because I'd be worried they'd hurt themselves. I know that he's very, very comfortable with me. I know that he's gonna stay in my hand and not try to flop and get to the floor. Uh, I know that he's not gonna get defensive when I put my hand in front of his face like this. I know that I can pet his chin and he's not going to, to do anything about it. Um, you know, besides keep approaching me and keep coming back. I mean, I've had the snake outside, he does the same thing outside. He'll go out, check something out, he comes back to me. He'll go out, check something out, come back to me. And it's not, once again, because he, he likes me, it's because I'm a comfort zone for him. He knows he can trust me, he knows he's safe. So he goes out, he explores, maybe he's like, ah, okay, it's a little outside of where I wanna be. Let me get back, let me reset, let me feel comfortable for a few minutes, then he'll go back out and do it again. Um, and a lot of snakes I've observed that behavior with over the course of time, taking them into new environments where I'm the consistent factor. And I mean, doing this in front of a snake and around a snake is, is you could very easily evoke a defensive response, but I'm not because of the trust that we have, because he basically ignores the fact that I could possibly be a threat to him. And that's what you want in your relationship with your snakes. And not all snakes are ever going to get to this level. Some, every snake is an individual. Every snake has that default personality. But if you put in the time and work, you can at least get most of them to be tractable enough to, you know, clean, feed, do what you need to do, or have them be comfortable in a captive environment. That's key too. Uh, if an animal's nervous all the time in captivity, that's no life for them. So we want to try to make them as comfortable and confident as we can. And so building a relationship of, of mutual trust and mutual respect is one of the best ways we can help them settle into captivity. So we'll see you guys next time. Thank you.